Okay, would you stand, please? And we are still in the Gospel of Luke, but we fast-forwarded just a little bit to get to Palm Sunday. Next week, we'll hit chapter 24, the resurrection, and then we'll go back to our chapter 16, verse-by-verse verse study through this. But we're in Luke 19. We're going to begin in verse 28. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mount, which is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. Verse 36, As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading, the preaching, and the living of his holy and precious word. Well, why do you worship and follow Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. Why do you worship and follow Jesus Christ, if you do? And if you don't, I think it's a good question to ask, why don't you? But listen, if your answer is not rooted in the truth of who Jesus is according to the Scriptures, or if your answer is only because of what he has done or can do for you, then you will fall away in time of trouble. This group did. Many, I won't say all, but many who on Palm Sunday were saying, Hail him, hail him, were saying, Nail him, just five days later. Because they weren't following the Jesus of the Bible. They had it right that he was Messiah and King. But they had his mission wrong. And when he wasn't showing up like the knight in shining armor that they thought he was. To destroy the Roman Empire and to set them up at the top of the pyramid. They bailed. And that's the way it will be. If your faith is not rooted in the Jesus of the Bible, if it's only in what you want him to be or in what he can do for you, then when trouble hits you, you will bail. And so let us learn from this story. Now, 
as I tried to show with the children here, there was a, there was a celebration breaking out. Uh, something kind of off script happened. I remember one time I was in Africa and I, I shared this story with the elders this weekend and uh, I was preaching and here comes a, a train of about six women. And I, as I looked over, I thought, okay, why are they just interrupting the service here? That's a little un-American. We don't do that here. But then I looked a little closer. I thought, that's, that's the women who've been cooking for us all week. And they had pots and pans and forks and spoons and knives. And they were just walking through the congregation, clanging and banging and shouting. And it was distracting for this preacher from Georgia, right? But the Holy Spirit gave me eyes to see through beyond the culture difference to see that these women in that culture, it wasn't inappropriate at all. They were giving what they had to the Lord. They were the cooks. They didn't know how to sing. They didn't have a place in the service, but they cooked and they were wanting to bring what they could before the Lord and shout joyfully. And I would tell you what the shouting sounded like, but it, it, it might cause you to stumble a little bit. Just pull me aside afterwards and I'll, and I'll give you their war cry. But, you know, it was, it was sort of a spontaneous outbreak of unscripted worship. And it, and it was really a beautiful sight. But I, th I think that's what's going on here. Now, it wasn't unscripted from God because a lot of prophecies are being fulfilled right here before our eyes. But here comes Jesus. And they, just, they took the palm branches, which would have been symbolic of, you know, a victory. Here comes the king. He's, he's victorious. Let's lay down the palm branches before him. And they were laying down their coats before him, saying, we submit ourselves to you. This is a, a sign of, uh, of honor and uh, recognition of royalty. But there's a party going on, a celebration going on, a coronation going on. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure that everybody understood what was really happening, but nevertheless, Jesus received their praise. Jesus received their praise. Um, one of the things I put in my notes was, listen, perhaps some understood the true king that Jesus was and others misunderstood but still celebrated this long-awaited day. They did recognize rightly, here's the Messiah, here's the King. But for sure, we know God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit knew Jesus' true identity and His true mission. And nothing was going to spoil this celebration. Jesus received it. Nothing was going to spoil this admiration. Nothing was going to spoil this coronation of here is your King bow before him. So what I want to do is show us through this passage the preparation in verses 28 through 34, the celebration in verses 35 to 40, and then the lamentation or the, the sadness, the, the judgment of verses 41 through 44. So let's look in the scriptures here, the preparation. Jesus is entering. He's going through Bethany. He's going through Bethpage. You might want to flip in a moment, look at the back of your Bible, that part that you probably never look at, the map section, and you'll see his route. It, it would be sort of like he's coming from Cartersville to East Rome and then into West Rome. And I know there's some families here who've just done that drive today. But very intentional route. He's coming from Jericho. If you look back into the beginning of chapter 19, we know that he entered Jericho and he saved Zacchaeus. And now he is entering through Bethany, Bethpage, and into Jerusalem. In the events that we've just read, this idea of, hey, you are to go and find a colt that has never been ridden, it will be tied up. You will say to the owner, the Lord has need of it. And they will say, well, then by all means, take it. And then you are to bring me the colt. 
And then they're going to put the coat on the colt, and they're going to put Jesus on the colt, and then Jesus is going to ride into the city. All of this preparation was carefully planned and ordered. And this shows us the Lord's foreknowledge, for sure. I mean, this went exactly as he said it would, but it also shows us not just that he knows the future, but that he controls the future. This shows us, as one commentator said, that there's not one maverick molecule in the entire universe, but that all is under the Lord Jesus' sovereign knowledge and sway. And so just as he had said, they go, they get this colt that's never been ridden. By the way, that was important, not only for prophecy, but in that day, an animal that was re reserved for holy purposes was set apart from common use. And there's no more noble and holy a purpose than what this cult was used for, to bring the King of kings and Lord of lords into the city. Now, many times in the Gospels, you've been with us, we're in Luke 19, We've seen this over and over many times in the Gospels. We see Jesus shushing the crowd when they proclaim his identity. When the demons cry out accurately, you are the Holy One. He will tell them, shut your mouth. Say nothing to no one. We, we call that the Messianic secret. It wasn't his time yet in those instances. It was not his time to be prematurely killed. He came to die a specific day in a specific way. But in this passage, we see that there is a willingness to peel back the green curtain and listen, not only receive the worship that is due him, but demand it. He is Lord over all creation. Matthew Henry said, he didn't steal this colt. You might be reading that story and go, wait, wait a minute. Did he, they just took someone's colt. And number one, it, it's as though he said, I'll give it back to you. The Lord has need of it for this specific task. But Matthew Henry said, all creatures belong to their creator. He had need of it. And it belonged to him as creator, so he took what was his. We see in this, not only is he Lord over creation through the go get the colt, but also this colt that had never been ridden submits to its creator, did not buck one time, but submitted under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we also see his willingness and demand to be worshipped. When the Pharisees said, would you please tell your disciples to shut their mouths? He said, in essence, you shut your mouth. If they don't praise me, even the rocks will cry out and praise and worship me. So this careful preparation was showing us his deity. It was showing, his, showing us his sovereignty. It was showing us his desire and the rightful worship. Now, why the cult? Why now? He had just walked about 18 miles from Jericho. Is he, is he now coming to the home stretch and he's tired and he says, hey, go, go get me something to ride on? No, there's a lot going on here to fulfill prophecy. Uh, Byron read Zechariah 9, 9, which tells us exactly what's going on here that this would be a sign that this was the Messiah and King that had been promised long ago. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your King is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The song that they were singing was out of Psalm 118, which is a messianic psalm. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, they got that right. They saw, here's the king that we've been waiting on. Here's the Messiah that we've been waiting on. Let's sing out of the, the Psalter, out of the Psalms. Let's sing a song befitting of the king. But they got his mission wrong. 
Genesis 49, 9 through 11, speaking of Judah, talks about how Judah will be likened unto a colt that is tethered to a vine. Jesus said, you will find this colt tied up, untie it, bring him to me. Showing us Jesus is the lion from the tribe of Judah. Much was going on here by way of fulfilling prophecy. So much that I don't have time to name them all, but let me name a few of these. D during this week that's coming, Holy Week, Passion Week, the final five, six days of Jesus' life before he would go to the cross. We see that he is the stone of stumbling. He is betrayed by a friend. His disciples would forsake him. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Potter's field was bought. He was struck on the cheek. He was silent in his suffering. Gall and vinegar were given to him to drink. Lots were cast for his garments. He was forsaken by God. He was pierced. He would die, but not a bone would be broken. He would be buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later, he would be raised from the dead. That's just a few of the prophecies that are being fulfilled this upcoming week, and some even this very day on Palm Sunday. So he wasn't just tired, brothers and sisters. Oh, go get me a an animal to ride in on. I've walked 18 miles. I'm tired. No, this was by divine design. Second reason that he came in on the cult was to show one more time that though Jesus is rightfully the King of kings and Lord of lords, Lord of all creation, he came as a servant king. In Jesus' life and death, he used a borrowed boat, according to Matthew's gospel. He rode a borrowed colt. He rode a borrowed colt into the town. He would be buried in a borrowed tomb. In the book of Revelation, it tells us that the next time Jesus comes back, it will not be on a borrowed colt, but on a regal white war horse. But Jesus was showing us, I'm the king, but I'm a servant king. And then one final reason why he came in on the colt. Warren Wearsby says this, it was to force the leader's hand to kill him on Passover weekend. Again, Jesus wasn't shying from his death. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 26, 3 through 5, we see that the leaders had said, oh, we're going to kill him, but after the Passover weekend so that it won't cause a big ruckus. But it was God's predetermined plan that he be the Passover lamb killed precisely on Passover weekend. So Wearsby said... And I agree, whereas they had hoped to arrest Jesus and kill him after the Passover, God ordained that he be slain on the Passover as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Every previous attempt to arrest Jesus had failed because his hour had not yet come, but this is his hour. And when they saw this great public celebration, the leaders knew that they had to act. And the willing cooperation of Judas solved their problem for them. And Jesus, according to God's predetermined plan, was killed on Passover weekend as our Passover lamb. So that's the preparation. Let's look at the celebration. Verses 35 and following. They, they brought this colt to Jesus. I love the disciples there. They're, they don't ask any questions. Hey, go. You're going to find a colt. It's tied up. The owner's going to say, hey, why are you untying the colt? And you're going to say, the Lord has need of it. And they're going to give you the colt. And you're going to bring the colt to me, just like I said. And they say, yes, Lord. And they go do it. Verse 35, they brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt, put, it, or put Jesus on it. And he was going. They were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as they... Uh, saw his approaching, uh, they began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. And then comes the song in Psalm 118, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So as I said, this is a celebration. And church, I want you, yes, we know what's coming on Friday. Trust me, Jesus knew what was coming on Friday. But don't let that... 
I'll say dampen, even though it's called Good Friday, right? Because we know that he had to die for us to be saved, and it, it was his joy to do the will of the Father. But still, don't miss this point of celebration and worship today. They were throwing a party for Jesus, and he was receiving it. As I said earlier, believe it or not, this is one of the very few times in the Bible where Jesus takes in the moment, allows himself to be the center of attention, allows the spotlight to be on him. He has every right to do that. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, but that's just not his style most of the time. And it wasn't his timing up until this time. I think of John 20, 28, when Thomas' great confession, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He receives that. But there just aren't a whole lot of times where we see what we're seeing today. This is a rare jewel that we're holding in our hand and pondering. Jesus was prophetically hoisted on to the colt. We read about those prophecies a moment ago. Genesis 49, Zechariah 9. Coats and robes were torn off of people's backs and thrown onto the ground. Jesus rode in across them. This was a sign of victory belongs to us because victory belongs to our King and Messiah. There were disciples, the Bible says, in that crowd yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. But there were also unbelievers in that crowd. We know that because of what would happen on Friday. The Pharisees were in that crowd telling Jesus' disciples to shut up. Telling Jesus to tell his disciples to shut up. They were crying out, Hosanna, which means save us, O Lord. Save us now. And I want you, among many things, to understand that Jesus took it all in and received it. In verse 37, it says, They began praising God for all the miracles which they had seen. In John's, John's account of this same story, it's in all four Gospels, John's account of this story says that one of the things that they couldn't get over and just kept praising God for was raising Lazarus from the dead. John chapter 12 tells us this. Think about the miracles that we've seen through the hand of our Lord up to this point. He had healed the sick. He had raised the dead. He had calmed storms. I was going over that feature of our Lord this morning. Uh, he had cast out demons. He had given the blind sight. He had given the deaf ears to hear. He had given the mute a voice to praise him. He had touched unclean, untouchable lepers and made them clean and whole. This is but a sampling of what our Lord had done up to this point in the story. And they were praising God for all of the miracles that they had seen Jesus perform. With this entrance, Jesus was making a statement of his kingship, of his right to be admired, of his right to be coronated and crowned as king. Jesus, we think of that, king of kings, lord of lords, but he had to earn that crown, and he did earn that crown, and he was given that crown by a mixed bag, no doubt, but this was a coronation service. We think of a donkey as a lowly animal, but to the Jew it was a beast fit for a king. 1 Kings 1, 33 and 44. And as I said earlier, the laying on the ground of palm branches and garments would have been a sign of receiving royalty in this day. So think about the celebration going on here. Jesus took it in. He received it. It was right for him to receive it. Let's join him in that as recognizing you're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You, you deserve all admiration. You deserve all honor and glory. 
You truly have given us the victory because you are the victorious king. Now, did Jesus not know that this would be a short-lived moment? Did Jesus not know that this ceremony on Sunday, hail him, hail him, would be just five days later, nail him, nail him? Did he not understand this? Did Jesus not know that many of the cries, Hosanna, save us, O Lord, were only a shallow temporary cry? Their idea of Messiah was of a political leader who would save them from the Romans, reverse the order, the food chain, and put them on top. See, they weren't alarmed at their sinfulness. They weren't saying, save us, O Lord, from the wrath of God. Save us from ourselves. Save us from sin and its corruption and save us from Satan. They were saying, Jesus, can you restore Jerusalem to the good old days? Did he not know that? Listen, let us remind ourselves that Jesus wasn't fooled one bit. Let us remind us that nothing going on this day or this coming Friday caught Jesus off guard. His story is moving ahead exactly as ordained. Jesus' death must be seen from this perspective. It was not a deviation from God's plan. It was the bullseye of the target. And Jesus knew it. And even though he knew Friday was coming, he stopped and smelled the palm branches and received worship, received this celebration. There's not one naive bone in Jesus' body. He is large and in charge, rest assured. He is conducting traffic perfectly he knew before the foundation of the world that they would sing Hosanna on Palm Sunday and shout crucify him on Good Friday. And yet, it doesn't deter him from receiving this moment of recognition. Now let's look lastly at the lamentation. So we've seen the preparation. We've seen the celebration. Let's look at verses 41 through 44, the lamentation. <clears throat> When he approached Jerusalem, <clears throat> he saw the city and wept over it. This is amazing, isn't it? This Jesus who, on the back of the colt, is saying to the, to, to the Pharisees who just said, Would you please tell your disciples to shut it? And he says, No, I won't. No, I won't. As a matter of fact, if they do shut it, the, the rocks themselves will cry out in worship. At the same moment, He's peering over the city and he begins to weep. There's a painting that Rembrandt designed and the, the, the marvelous feature of this is it's a portrait of Jesus and if you cover one side of Jesus' eye and face, it looks as though he's smiling. And if you cover the other eye and part of that face of Jesus. It looks like he's weeping. And yet, then you look back at it and there's a strange coming together in one person. He received their worship. He received their praise. He received their celebrating and coronating him as king. There was joy. I really believe that. There was joy in Jesus' heart at this moment. And yet at the same time, he was weeping over Jerusalem. Kent Hughes says, And with the whole city before his eyes, the Savior began to weep. We must never forget this. It was not with quiet tears that he wept, as he had done at the graveside of Lazarus whom he was going to resurrect, but with loud and deep sorrow. There in the middle of the road, with the great city in dramatic panorama, the stunned multitude ceased their song of Hosanna and listened to the Lord of the universe 
well over Jerusalem. This was a new kind of king indeed. Jonathan Edwards speaking of this complexity of Jesus, the joy, the weeping in one person, he says this, in Revelation, Jesus is likened unto a lion and a lamb. The lion excels in strength and in majesty. The lamb excels in meekness and patience. But we see that Jesus in this text is compared to both. It's Re Revelation chapter 5. Because the diverse excellencies of both wonderfully meet in the one person of Jesus. There in Jesus Christ is a conjunction of such really diverse excellencies as otherwise would have seemed to us utterly incompatible in the same person. In Jesus, we find infinite majesty, yet complete humility, perfect justice, yet boundless grace, absolute sovereignty, yet utter submission, all sufficiency in himself, and yet entirely trusting and depending upon the Holy Spirit. I would add to that, in Jesus we see him joyfully receiving the praise and the worship and weeping at the same moment. God had visited them in Christ and they had missed the boat. And not only would they be judged physically, isn't this a chilling foreshadowing of exactly what's going to happen 40 years later? Look at verse 43. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will th throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the day of your visitation. And that's exactly what happens 40 years after this. God had visited them in Christ. They had missed the boat. Not only would they be judged physically, but also God's judgment. Listen, Jesus is the Passover lamb, but God's judgment would not pass over this group, but would fall squarely upon them on judgment day. God's window of mercy, God's door of grace was now closed to them. I didn't know if I was going to share this part or not, but just give me just a moment and think with me. In, in, Ma in Mark 11, 11, we, we see a little bit of a detail that we don't see in Luke. And in that, it says he rode into the city and he walked into the temple and he looked around intently. And then he left. But tomorrow, Monday, he would come back and he would cleanse that temple for the second time. And he would say to that barren fig tree that should have been bearing fruit, cursed are you, wither up and die and never bear fruit again. And it reminds me, because it's just a little throwaway statement, he looked around in the temple and then left. And it reminds me that we must never mistake our Lord's silence for his approval. I mean, I mean, think about it. If you were there and you saw Jesus come in and you're thinking, uh-oh, hope, hope everything's in order here. And, and he looks around. And he leaves. And you think, we passed inspection. We're all right. But we know what Jesus saw. He saw dead religion. He saw a temple that should have been filled with life and the spirit and the true understanding of the Passover lamb is among us. They missed it by a mile. There was worldliness, there was spiritual corruption in the very place that he had given so much light and truth and privilege. 
His silence on Sunday was not a sign of his approval at all. In fact, like I said, 24 hours later, he would be back flipping tables and cleansing the temple for the second time. He would curse the fig tree that was representative of Israel and say, you should be bearing fruit. You're not curse. Put a curse on you. Revelation talks about Jesus walking through his churches and inspecting them. I wonder what does Jesus see when he inspects Providence Baptist Church? <clears throat> what does he see when he inspects your life, your home? Let us not mistake our Lord's silence for his approval. We can look into the scriptures and see what he commands of us. What he expects, that when he comes and lifts up the, the leafy portion of the tree to find the fruit, that he's looking for fruit. He expects fruit in our lives. <clears throat> what does he see about our love for one another, for the lost, for his glory? <clears throat> well, I close with this. I want us to emulate this crowd's joy. I want us to emulate this crowd's praise and worship and recognition of Jesus as the King and Messiah. I want us to sing and celebrate. Listen, not as if we don't know what's coming on Friday, but precisely because we do know what's coming on Friday, and Jesus knew as well, and we also know what's coming on Sunday, don't we? The tomb is empty. But let's learn from this group's misunderstanding. Listen, I can't say it any clearer than this. Let's worship and follow the Jesus of the Bible who came to deliver us from God's wrath, from the penalty, the power, and one day the presence of sin. Let's trust this Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, and listen, let's follow him no matter what. Not, I'll follow you if you put me on top of the pyramid and put my enemies under my feet. No, that's not learning from what they messed up with. Jesus you are worthy of my praise, my worship, my allegiance because of who you are revealed in Scripture, not just for what you do in my life. I want to trust you and follow you no matter what. Knowing, listen, knowing not that trouble might come, but if you're truly following Jesus, trouble will come because you're following Jesus. But you've settled it, that it's, it's, it's okay because he's worthy no matter what, that this is not going to be your best life now, that that's still to come, that as I said a couple of weeks ago in a sermon, as a Christian, the day you die will be the best day you've ever lived, but not the best day you ever will live because that will be on resurrection day when you get a new body and you worship in the new heavens and the new earth with your Lord Jesus. That's what they missed. Let's not miss it. Corey Ten Boom leaves us with this. She said, Do you think for a moment that the cult thought that all the pomp and parade was for it? Not at all. So it is with us. We are but the donkey. The cult. Jesus is the main attraction. He and he alone deserves the glory and the praise. We are truly nothing without Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message. I know we have different personalities and some are extroverts, some are introverts, some are more... Uh, introspective some are, are are just more emotional 
whatever it, it looks like in the way that you've made us, let us celebrate today. Let us lift up a joyful song to you. Hosanna. Hosanna. The Lord has saved us. King of kings, Messiah, promised, long-awaited one, you have come. Glory, majesty, honor belong to you. Jesus, we know there was not one naive bone in your body. You knew full well what was coming Friday. We know what's coming Friday. We also know what's coming Sunday. This is a high time for the Christian. Renew our faith. Renew our joy. Renew our desire to make much of you. I pray that we would know why we worship you and praise you and follow you and that it would be rooted in the truth and the beauty of who you are. I pray again that if there's anyone here who is yet to submit themselves like the colt and say, Jesus, come and have your rightful place in my life. I don't want to buck you any longer. I pray that that would happen today even while we sing. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your magnificent, royal name.